proven with many more studies. Unfortunately, um, this one paper led to a complete uh, media storm uh, where the media, um, including some celebrities, uh, particularly a few with autistic children, uh, completely sensationalized um, the results of this report. And this was really the start of how, um, how autism had essentially a, a bad influence on, on vaccination rates. So, um, but we're not here to, you know, necessarily um, blame the media or blame uh, Andrew Wakefield, um, although they both should be accountable, but really to talk about what's the truth. So since the Andrew Wakefield paper in 1998, uh, more than 25 independent studies have been conducted um, which refute the connection between uh, the MMR vaccine and the development of autism. Um, in addition, uh, one of the theories about how MMR may cause autism uh, was through um, a preservative in the vaccine that's called thimerosal that contains mercury. And so other studies, um, a number now growing, I think six or seven studies now, have also refuted a connection uh, between mercury or this thimerosal preservative in autism. And the media reported um, these um, uh, these, these studies, uh, but we were already really set back um, a number of years um, in, in vac vaccination uh, efforts. Um, so I just wanted to show just a couple snippets of data from some of these studies. Uh, first, I return back to this graph of autism cases um, in the U.S., and I just want to draw your attention to this dot here. In 1999, uh, thimerosal, the mercury-containing preservative in the MMR, was removed. Um, the removal of thimerosal from the MMR vaccine obviously uh, didn't uh, stifle the incidence of autism uh, in America. Another study which was actually quite interesting was done in a community in Japan. So in Japan in the early um, 90s, the Japanese health organization decided to split up the MMR vaccine into three independent shots for kids. And so um, what happened was the number of kids getting the trivalent um, MMR vaccine went down. So this is a little bit of a complicated graph, but I just want to draw your attention to the yellow line first. And, uh, and so when this study first started uh, in 1998, more than 70% off the scale here, uh, children got the trivalent MMR vaccine. But as they started switching over to the monovalent single measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines, um, by 1992, virtually zero children um, in this study were vaccinated with the trivalent MMR vaccine. However, the case of um, autism cases and as well as autism spectral disorders, so this is just kind of um, a, a larger definition of autism. So contains more um, cases. So in the red and in the blue, um, the stoppage of uh, vaccinated children with the trivalent uh, vaccine did not um, suppress the number of autism or autism spectral disorder cases um, within this community. So based on these studies um, and a few other interesting points, uh, one of the other interesting points was that um, it was found out after this study was published that Andrew Wakefield was being paid um, by litigants in a case against a vaccine manufacturer to do these studies. So this is what we call conflict of interest. He was being paid to prove something, and he proved it. Um, in addition, um, uh, the this, this study was, was really small, and so all of these other studies now contain information about hundreds of thousands of kids, not eight out of 12. Um, and he was also accused of cherry-picking some of his data. Um, some of the co-authors actually on this manuscript that signed uh, the retraction letter um, went back to some of the original data and couldn't reproduce all of um, his findings. Um, so in 2004, um, the British journal The Lancet retracted the paper. Um, for scientists, what this means is that it's, it's um, no longer valid. It's not real. Um, unfortunately, it was a little too late. Um, despite this retraction, and this one single publication has really caused 
irreparable damage to vaccination efforts. And I'll talk a little bit more about one direct effect uh, of this publication in, in England. Um, autism is still out there. And we're still undergoing whatever you want to call it, an autism epidemic. Um, there are a variety of um, possible reasons um, for the rise in autism in the world today. Um, probably not all, all of which are true, probably not um, um, some of which probably uh, are true. But right now, the link between vaccines and autism is just the age. And so uh, children get a lot of vaccines in their first couple of years of life, and um, symptoms of autism start to develop between two and three years uh, of age. Um, Although the causes, whether they be environmental or not, are still unknown, uh, there is a high genetic component. And this is known uh, because of studies done with twins. So if one identical twin develops autism, the chance of the second twin uh, developing autism is more than 90%. But if those twins are fraternal, so they don't share all the same DNA, the chance is less than 10%. Um, I guess if we have to find some good that's come out of all of this uh, media um, portrayal of autism, even within vaccines, is that the awareness of autism has definitely increased a lot over the last 10 years. And, uh, and uh, research in this area has also increased tremendously. So it's our hope as uh, scientists and individuals that will uh, gain a better understanding of the causes of autism, whether they be environmental or genetic or other, um, and um, hopefully also uh, find some cures uh, or cure for autism. OK, so that's all I have on autism. But um, I also wanted to address some of the most common questions uh, regarding vaccines. And so those are listed here. Uh, first and foremost, are vaccines really necessary? Uh, what is herd immunity? Um, uh, a, a question that a lot of uh, parents ask their pediatricians are the childhood vaccines, are these shots too much too soon for a young immune system? Uh, why do we need a flu shot every year? And I'll end by speculating why we don't have an HIV vaccine yet. So first, are vaccines really necessary? I'm an immunologist, so I say yes. Um, but I'm going to give you three different reasons why um, I believe, and many of us do, that vaccines are necessary. Uh, the first is to prevent or dampen diseases caused by very common infections. And so some of these can, can include flu, which is caused by influenza virus, uh, whooping cough, and chickenpox. And these are some of our more common infections because they are so contagious that you know just one infection in a community, in a school, um, or in any close-knit uh, working area can just uh, cause, cause an outbreak. So it's important that you get your vaccines um, against these infections. And for the vaccines that are very effective, uh, particularly whooping cough, um, the pertussis vaccine, and chickenpox, this will prevent you from getting the disease. Uh, from flu, in a lot of cases, it prevents you from getting the disease. Uh, but in some cases, um, it doesn't, but it may help to dampen uh, your symptoms of disease, which is still uh, beneficial. So the second reason why vaccines are really necessary is to prevent infections that can reemerge. And the best um, example of this is measles. And so this um, was a case study done in England um, that um, was done immediately prior to, but during, essentially, the anti-vaccine movement from this Andrew Wakefield uh, paper. And so um, from the late 90s to about 2003, the uh, percent of children that received their trivalent MMR vaccine in this, in this uh, patient study went from more than 90 down to about 80%. Uh, and that's shown in red in, in the scale is, is over here, so about 80% in 2003. What happened thereafter was a spike in measles infection, now shown in blue. What's interesting here, and you may note, is that there seems to be a little bit of a delay in the outbreak of measles um, after this drop in vaccination, it's in, and it's about two years. And that occurs because of a... Um, scientific term that we call herd immunity. 
and it's, it can also be known as community immunity. And what this means is, or what this refers to, is when most of the people in a given community are immunized, have gotten their vaccines. And this is a good thing because it can stifle the spread of disease. So how does it do that? So if you think of this as a community of people, and the people that are color-coded in yellow are immunized and healthy, so they got their vaccines. And there's a few people in this community who weren't immunized and they're <coughs> sick. They have an infection. Let's just say they have measles. What happens is that many of the people around them are immunized, so they won't be infected. Sometimes they'll come into contact with an unimmunized uh, but not sick person, color-coded in blue, and those people may then be infected. But because there's so many immunized people around them, it really stifles the spread. In contrast, if we look at the complete opposite picture, if there is a community in which no one has gotten their vaccines, you can imagine quite easily that just a few infected individuals will spread this disease really fast throughout this community. So uh, studies have been done on community immunity and uh, show that it works best when more than 90% are immune. So if you remember the graph that I just showed you from England, the measles and the MMR um, vaccination rates started off 90 and dropped down to 80. So community immunity was helping for a little while until there was fewer and fewer people who were immunized. Another point I want to make here that's actually a pretty important one and, and something that I don't know if, if everyone actually really understands, but herd immunity and having a community like this can protect those who cannot be vaccinated. So those are people with potential allergies to vaccine components. For example, people with egg allergies don't typically get the seasonal flu vaccines because they're grown in eggs. Um, cancer patients who are under, undergoing uh, chemotherapy and radiation treatments, these treatments weaken your immune system. And these people should not get uh, live attenuated vaccines. Uh, transplant recipients take drugs to suppress their immune system. They also should not be getting their um, any, uh, any uh, live attenuated vaccines. And so on some level, um, the choice to get a vaccine either for yourself or to have your children vaccinated, on some level that is an individual choice, but the outcome of that decision um, actually may impact more than just you or just your child. It may impact other members of your community. And those are things to think about when making these decisions. Okay, so the third reason why vaccines are really necessary um, are to prevent infections that are common in other parts of the world. So an example here is polio. We live in a time and place in which we don't really understand how devastating polio is. But just 50, 60 years ago, polio crippled and killed thousands of children a year. Um, we have had uh, two successful vaccines for polio now in the last 50 years, and uh, polio was officially declared eliminated in the United States in 1994. As of 2000, uh, 36 countries were declared polio free, but it is still a health risk in some parts of the world, uh, including uh, some parts of Southern Asia and Africa. And so, um, and there's ongoing global efforts to eradicate polio from the world, but it's, it's been a little tough bug. Um, and so it's important to note that polio, especially with all of the worldwide international travel that a lot of people do these days, polio is only a plane ride away, and you don't even have to be on that plane. So moving on to the second question, you know, so many shots for kids these days, and a lot of parents wonder, is it just too much? Um, well, you should know that although the number of actual shots that your children are receiving are many more than they were 10, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, um, actually the number of parts of these uh, vaccines that activate the immune system uh, has actually decreased. And this happens because of our research and our knowledge of what parts of viruses and bacteria um, activate those uh, memory B cells and memory T cells. Um, it's also important that the number of microbes um, that are just 
here. Uh,